Hello everyone, welcome back to Science Time with Jody. I'm Jody, and this is the show where we take your out of this world questions and bring them down to earth. This show is made in partnership with the Moorhead State University Star Theater, where I am a planetarium operator. It was also made in partnership with the Challenger Learning Center of Kentucky in Hazard, Kentucky. Have you ever looked at the stars at the nighttime sky and just wondered about space? Well, I know you do, because you've sent in so many wonderful questions when I asked for them. And I wanted to thank you for those, by the way. They're such amazing questions, and the show really wouldn't be possible without them. And in today's very special episode of Science Time with Jody, we get answers to a lot of your out-of-this-world questions. And the answers come from former NASA astronaut and member of the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame, Dr. Scott Perizinski. Now. Please enjoy this interview where I was able to ask Dr. Scott Perizinski your out of this world questions. So Dr. Perizinski, I would first like to start by thanking you for agreeing to interview. Good to be with you, Jody. Thanks for inviting me. And I've heard recently that you're quite the adventurer. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, so, I think life is an adventure for sure, but go ahead, go ahead with your question. All right. Well, my viewers may not know this, but but I did hear that you were the first person to not only travel through space, but to also climb Mount Everest. And someone suggested that I should ask why you brought moon rocks to the summit with you. Ah, it's a great question. Um, so I am an explorer. Um, I, I love to challenge myself, but also uh, to, uh, to press the boundaries of technology and and uh, to learn in these extraordinary environments like space, like on the top of Mount Everest. Uh, you know, it's the, the physical challenge, but also the technological challenge, the, uh, um, the health and medical challenges that are there. So um, I've been very fortunate to, to visit some extraordinary places and I'm inspired by some extraordinary people like Sir Edmund Hillary, who is the very first to Summit Mount Everest back in 1953, and, and Neil Armstrong, the first to set foot on the moon in uh, 1969. And you may not know this, but both of those uh, very famous explorers were good friends later in life. They, they actually went to the North Pole together, and um, they were oh, wow. very uh, motivational to me. They, they were my heroes growing up. And so when I, I went to Mount Everest in 2009 to climb the mountain, I got special permission from NASA to borrow a small lunar sample that Neil had, um, had picked up on the surface of the moon on the Sea of Tranquility. And I took this tiny little lunar sample to the top of the world and uh, uh, ended up um, uh, bringing back a, a summit rock from the, the top of, the, of our planet as well. We mounted it on a beautiful plaque that's now aboard the International Space Station in the Tranquility Module, which is kind of cool. So it's there to inspire future generations of explorers. Well, that's amazing. Thank you for telling me that. You got so most of thank you. So most of our viewers' questions are, of course, about your time in space. And is my research correct that you've been to space five five times with around seven spacewalks? That's exactly right. Uh, I was very fortunate to fly on the space shuttle. Uh, five different trips, uh, twice on the Space Shuttle Atlantis, uh, twice on Discovery, and once on Endeavor. And, uh, and the missions were very different. Uh, they included uh, uh, spacewalking tasks, robotics, medical science, and other types of, uh, you know, um, types of uh, physical sciences that we conducted during those, uh, those five missions. And as part of those flights, I went outside into the vacuum of space on, on seven spacewalks, which is really the best job in the universe, getting a chance to go out outside in, in your own personal spaceship to do work out there. It's a lot of fun. I'd say so. <laughs> so Matthew, age 11, from Gastonia, North Carolina, and Houston, age 14, from Hazard, Kentucky, would like to know what it feels like to blast off. And Lily, age 12, from Mount Holly, North Carolina, would like to know what it's like to go up in a spaceship. For example, did you get nervous or happy? Great, great questions. And I like the way you group that all together, Jody. So um, the, uh, the sensation of launching into space is just unlike anything I can uh, you know, 
possibly imagine, uh, except for perhaps uh, a roller coaster. So I'm sure you've been on a roller coaster uh, before. It's, you know, there's a sense of acceleration that you feel as you're going down the steepest part of the steepest hill on a roller coaster ride. It's sort of like that, except it's a whole lot steeper. Uh, the acceleration is three times your normal body weight. So it's squeezing your chest about uh, three uh, times uh, gravity, or we call it three Gs. Uh, so it, it takes a lot of extra energy to, to take in a deep breath. It feels like a sumo wrestler sitting on your chest. You have to you know, force a, a breath in and then you just relax to exhale. Um, but uh, just an amazing amount of acceleration, noise, vibration, and you have this huge grin on your face because you can't believe that anything could, could move that fast for that long, you know, to accelerate up into space. Uh, in eight and a half minutes, we go from zero miles an hour on the launch uh, pad to 17,500 miles an hour. That's how, how fast you have to be going to, to get into orbit. And uh, it's just, just an incredibly wild ride. And, um, and then you, you finally make it to orbit what we call MECO or main engine cutoff and things start to float around like cables that are around the, the, the crew compartment start to float around and and uh, you know bottles may start to or you know you know checklists or whatever start to float around and it, it's just a, a wonderful sensation but you are a little bit nervous uh, yeah you, you you're really concerned that uh, um, you know everyone uh, uh, who's put the shuttle together has, has tightened uh, the bolts uh, appropriately and, and uh, that you're fully trained for the, the tasks that you're going to have to do on the flight. But uh, it's an exhilarating thing for sure. Wow. Well, I actually have a follow-up question. Um, this one's from me, and I was wondering, was it the same all five times or was there something different or new each time? There was something new and different each time, Jody. In fact, uh, I would say that the experience got better and better each time. The first time I went up, I, uh, I was a little nervous. I uh, quite a bit nervous, actually. Uh, I didn't know how I would feel. I wanted to do a really good job. I didn't want to make any mistakes because a lot of scientists had spent years getting their, their experiments ready to fly in the shuttle with us. So I wanted to do a really good job for them. And I wanted to have an opportunity to fly again. So I had all these uncertainties before my first flight. But with each subsequent flight, I had more and more confidence. And so by the fifth and final flight that I took, I could really absorb it all. I, re I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I had a little bit more time to kind of appreciate the, the view back to the planet Earth and looking out at the moon and th imagining what it would be like to, to one day go there. So it gets better with, with each flight for sure. All right, well, that's great. So I know that in your space travels, you have never landed on the moon, but would you happen to have any insight to offer Winfred, age seven from Breathitt County, Kentucky, who would like to know what it feels like to walk on the moon or to touch the moon? Well, I've touched the moon because uh, I've, I've, I took that lunar sample with me to uh, Everest. So I actually had a piece of the moon in my, um, my down jacket for about uh, two months uh, on the side of Everest. So I've spent a lot of time with moon rocks, but I've never actually been to the moon. Um, what I have done, though, is I've spent time in one of NASA's interesting simulators. It's actually a, an aircraft uh, that uh, does parabolic uh, arcs, kind of like a porpoise diving uh, along the surface of the ocean. And at the top of these arcs, the pilot will push the nose of the plane down. You get about 30 seconds of weightlessness or a little bit longer of one-sixth gravity, uh, which is the the gravitational pull that you would feel on the moon. So I've actually had a chance to hop on on the on the moon simulated in the, in this aircraft in a spacesuit, and it's it's pretty wonderful. You, you can actually, you know, do a bunny hop and and uh, travel six times as far as you would here on Earth, for example. Um, so you feel like you're an Olympic athlete when you're you're living and working. I think in a in a partial gravity environment like that. It's a lot of fun, and, and what's really exciting is that we're actually preparing to return to the moon uh, with uh, Project Artemis. NASA, you may have heard, is, is building uh, the capability to land uh, uh, the next man and the first woman uh, to, to visit the moon here, hopefully by 2024. I suspect it may take a little bit longer than that, but uh, it's going to be really exciting. I think one day we'll have 
uh, a lunar settlement there, um, maybe somewhat similar to the, the outpost that we have on uh, the South Pole of our, our own planet Earth uh, in Antarctica. Uh, we'll have scientists working there year round, uh, doing you know, important science and then hopefully allowing us to, to leapfrog and, and get to Mars too. Well, that's going to be an exciting adventure for all those people. You bet. You bet. So a lot of my viewers want to know what it's like to live in space, more particularly to be in microgravity. Mm -hmm. So Aiden, age 11, from Gastonia, North Carolina, asked the question all kiddos this age want to know. How do you use the bathroom in space and where does it go? Also, well, what happens if you were to fart in space? <laughs> Well, I think that would be propulsive, we would say. That means uh, just like a, a rocket engine, if you have uh, um, you know, exhaust going that way, it's going to be like a rocket engine and push you in the opposite direction, equal and opposite reaction. So uh, that's a, a basic law of physics that uh, maybe you've not covered in school yet, but you will. Um, but uh, in terms of you know, kind of the basic plumbing, you know, how do you go to the bathroom in space? Well, it, it works kind of similar to what you have uh, at home. You need to get rid of uh, liquid and solid waste, right? So unfortunately, you don't wanna have liquid you know, floating around the, the, uh, the cabin. That would be really, uh, really gross. You get really, uh, really messy very quickly. So what's a nice advantage of being in space is that outside of the spacecraft, we have an unlimited vacuum. So uh, basically what we, we use is uh, um, a plumbing system, but there's a hose with a, a male or a female adapter, and you can urinate into that. Uh, and then there's actually a, a toilet seat. That we call it the throne, but it has a couple of uh, uh, leg restraints that uh, hold you down. You, you certainly wouldn't want to go floating off now, would you? That'd be that'd be pretty pretty bad. But uh, you you get a good seal on this seat, and uh, there's like a stick shift, that almost like uh, on an old old fashioned car. You, open up the, uh, the stick shift uh, trap door and uh, you get rid of the solid waste and close the, close the trap door. So that's, that's pretty much how it works. Um, sort of similar to, uh, uh, to being at home, but there's a lot more overhead you know, kind of getting ready. You have to have your, your toilet paper ready and, and uh, your, your supplies to get cleaned up afterwards, ready to go. Well, for our next question, Aiden, along with Mary from Green Grove Springs in Florida, and Matthew, age 11, from Gastonia, North Carolina, they would all like to know what you eat in space, and is it still dehydrated food? Well, you have more selection now. Uh, you know, in the end of the space shuttle program and now on the International Space Station, you have a wide variety of foods, and what's nice about it is that the space program is very international. So we have astronauts, not just from the United States, but we have Canadians, Europeans, Russians, Japanese, and, and visiting astronauts from elsewhere in the world as well. So what's really fun is uh, when you fly with an international astronaut, uh, they may bring specialty food from, from their home country. I flew with a couple of French astronauts during my career and they brought food from uh, a very famous French chefs in, in Paris. Uh, some of them were dehydrated, others were, uh, we call, called it thermostabilized, but in cans that uh, um, you, you wouldn't have to refrigerate. They, they would be um, fine until the point that you opened them. So we would uh, fly these, these canned goods as well and put them in an oven to heat them up and then very carefully open up the cans and eat uh, whatever it was. Um, we also would bring some fresh foods, so uh, cheeses, salamis, uh, I always brought Oreo cookies. That was one of my favorite things to, to take up in space. And they're kind of fun to kind of, you know, throw uh, to your buddies across the cabin um, <laughs> to have some fun with, with food in space. Tortillas are really a lot of fun as well. Um, we don't take regular bread because it makes lots of crumbs and it gets in our eyes. So we use tortillas. So we'll make, you know, tacos, uh, breakfast tacos with eggs and salsa, uh, things like that. Um, Happy. And then... Uh, there are, there are kind of camping type foods, dehydrated foods that uh, we'll also use. So, you know, think about things like uh, macaroni and cheese. That's another one of my favorite things to eat in space. It's a small little pouch about this big and you add about four or five ounces of hot water and let it sit for a few minutes. 
and then very carefully you open up that package and go in with a spoon and eat it. If you're careless though, it'll fling uh, you know, cheese sauce all over the, the crew compartment and people get really mad at you. So you have to be very careful with that. I say that would be one, I say that would be definitely a mess you'd have to clean up. That's right. And not a fun responsible. one responsible. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm curious, how, what is it like to clean up in the ISS? Like, you know, clean the walls or something. Do you always get pushed back whenever you try? Yeah, yeah, that you're exactly right. You're, you're, uh, you, it's uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the basic laws of uh, physics that Sir Isaac Newton helped uh, help describe. But there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if if um, if I push off on my my screen over my second screen over here, I would actually fly like you know Buzz Lightyear over here. And so you have to be very careful when you're working on anything, you actually have to think about how are you going to restrain yourself. And so there are handrails all over the place so you can hold on with your hands or kind of curl your toes underneath the handrails and position yourself so that you could actually uh, clean a surface. And it's really important to, uh, to keep your spaceship clean. So up on board the International Space Station, Sunday afternoons typically uh, are the day that the crew uh, spends, you know, cleaning all the surfaces, uh, you know, things that uh, might have gotten out of hand during the, the work week. Um, yeah. And then even when you're, you know, when you're doing things, you try and keep things pretty tidy. Astronauts have to exercise uh, almost two hours a day. And uh, up in space, it's kind of funny when you, when you do sweat in space, the sweat doesn't fall off of your body. It kind of grows. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Flubber but it sort of looks like jello. It's kind of growing on your body. You kind of glisten. And if you're careless at all, the, this, this whole sheet of uh, sweat will kind of fly off and, and hit, the, hit the walls around you. So you have to always keep a towel with you and wipe off frequently so that you don't make a, a real mess because it can get really kind of gross when you, <laughs> when you exercise. Well, speaking of exercise, um, Brian from Sugar Hollow, Kentucky would like to know about how astronauts have to exercise in space. And I do believe you invented the intercline resistance device. Could you talk a little bit about the exercise and your invention? Sure. Well, it, it, that's a great question, Brian. And, and, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really important that we preserve our, our, our physical well-being when we're in space. Uh, but the, the problem in living and working in space is that we don't have gravity impacting our body. So as I'm even sitting here talking to you guys, my, my muscles and bones, and my heart muscle are pumping against gravity. So I'm actually doing work. It doesn't look like I'm, I'm working except moving my, uh, my mouth, but I'm actually doing physical work. I'm burning calories and it loads my bones and keeps them strong. When you're in space, you're floating around all the, all over the place. They aren't, working nearly as hard. And so what we do to, to keep our strength so that when we come back to earth, we, we won't just be a, a, a limp noodle uh, when we land, we have to exercise. We have to do resistive exercise, the equivalent of lifting weights up in space. And we also have to keep our heart muscles strong so that uh, you know, when we land, we could, we could save ourselves in an emergency, especially. We can't take a typical weight set up into space because you're in weightlessness, right? So we actually have to use hydraulic systems to push on our body. So we can do squats and, and uh, bench presses and, and all sorts of similar exercises up in space, but with a, a fancy kind of universal gym. And then we have a, a treadmill and a bike ergometer. And on the space shuttle, we had a rowing ergometer as well, which is a lot of fun. So lots of different ways to, uh, to stay in shape. One of the things that I invented was a, a way to exercise one side of my body against the other and uh, put it in a very compact kind of uh, package. So uh, we called it the interlimb resistance device or ILRD. And I flew it on my first space shuttle flight and it worked really, really well. When you don't have a lot of room on your spacecraft for a big exercise rack, you could take something like the, uh, the interlimb resistance device and, and stay pretty fit. For a, for a long period of time. Okay. Well, now I think we're going to go back to microgravity just a little bit. So 
So Charlie from Moorhead, Kentucky, wanted to know what was it like experiencing zero gravity for the first time? Oh, gosh. It was such an amazing experience, Charlie. I, in fact, um, I can still remember it uh, vividly to this day. Um, and it was, wasn't even in space. I remember I, I was talking about that special plane that does these parabolic arcs. It's, it's a, an amazing uh, aircraft. Um, it has a, is a funny name to it. It's called the Vomit Comet uh, to astronauts because um, even though we get about 30 seconds of weightlessness when the pilot pushes the nose of the plane over, he or she also has to then pull the nose up at about two Gs to get into another parabola to do it all over again. So over the course of this flight, you may experience 40 of these parabolas. Um, and some of that maneuvering can actually be really kind of nausea or even vomit inducing. So they call that this plane the Vomit Comet. Thankfully, I, I never uh, got sick on the airplane. I, I just love the experience. But uh, my very first time in weightlessness was on this plane. And I got a chance to test that inner limb resistance device that we were just testing and talking about. And uh, at the end of the flight, um, we took about four or five parabolas and we just tried to see how many flips we could do without hitting the ceiling or crashing on the floor. And it was awesome. And I think I got up to four or five uh, revolutions in a spin uh, before the, uh, the, the parabola ended. And uh, I knew for sure that uh, in my future, I wanted to become an astronaut. That was, <laughs> there's nothing that I wanted to do more in life than, than fly in space. And it, you know, once you actually get a chance to, to fly um, for a longer period of time in space, you really get, uh, get into the groove of moving up in weightlessness. To be able to just push off with your fingertips and fly with precision to do uh, you know, flips and spins like an Olympic gymnast or an Olympic diver, it's just really awesome, really beautiful. So I've heard a lot before that it can take a while to get used to living in zero into no microgravity. So I was wondering how long it took you. Well, you, the, the first uh, uh, few days on a, your first shuttle flight, you feel kind of klutzy. You feel you know, clumsy. Uh, people tend to lose things. Um, here on Earth, you know, if, if, you, if you're like writing something, you can set your pen down and it'll be there when you come back. That won't happen in space. If you set something down, the air currents or someone floating by is just going to jostle it. And it, you may find it a couple days later in the cabin air cleaner, also known as the lost and found. You know, they have these big fans that kind of circulate air through the, the space shuttle. And invariably, you know, you'd find your fork or your pen uh, or whatever you'd lost uh, in the cabin air cleaner. So with each subsequent flight, you got better and better, more aware of your surroundings. But you really had to concentrate on, okay, I'm, I'm done with using this pen. I'm going to Velcro it right here. And, uh, and I know that it's going to be there when I get back. Um, when you're outside on a spacewalk, it's even more critical. You have to tether onto everything uh, or it's going to be gone. I mean, it, the, there's no cabin air cleaner out there. It's, it's, it's lost forever. So um, you really have to think about everything you do, especially with tools and, and getting in the right you know, body position uh, to work out there. Okay. So, uh, so Ethan, Mary, and Lily would like to know about the return trip. Um, they want to know how did you get back to Earth? How long did it take you to readjust to Earth's gravity? And I would personally like to know what reentry was like for you. Is it because it, it, it looks kind of scary in movies? <laughs> well, Ethan, um, Mary, and Lily, um, and, and Jordy, uh, great question. It's a, uh, it's a. Uh, um, very different than the launch. It's uh, uh, less Gs. So we, when we, when we launch up into space, um, we feel about three times our normal body weight, or three Gs. On the way down, it's only uh, one and a half Gs. So it's it's less acceleration felt on our body, and it's in a different direction. It, it, our our blood is being pulled from our head down to our toes. So it, it gives us the sensation of being lightheaded. And so in order to make sure that we have enough uh, wherewithal to land the space shuttle, they actually put us in what's called the G-suit. And that actually is, think of it as a, 
like a, a like a tuxedo cummerbund, if you know what that is, something that squeezes your belly. And then there are also devices inside your spacesuit that squeeze your legs and all the way down to your calves. And what that does is that keeps blood in our circulation and allows us to have enough blood circulating to, to land the shuttle and do the critical activities we need to do on the way back home. So it's a little bit different. Uh, you're, you're relatively dehydrated, so you, you don't have enough, you know, uh, uh, fluid on board typically. Uh, so we, we end up uh, drinking lots of fluid before we come back home, and we also take some salt tablets so that we, we, we feel strong enough to, to withstand the, you know, the landing. And, um, and the, the landing itself is, uh, is pretty extraordinary if you're up on the flight deck of the space shuttle. And also if you're on a, on a Soyuz capsule or, uh, as you probably know, this upcoming week, there's going to be a launch of a, a SpaceX capsule, a really, really exciting mission coming up. Uh, the first time ever uh, to, to launch astronauts to the International Space Station, the SpaceX Dragon capsule. They'll be up there for one to four months, but ultimately they're going to have to come back through the atmosphere. And anytime a spacecraft comes through the atmosphere, you have to exchange all that, we call it uh, you know, kinetic energy or motion into uh, uh, heat energy. We're basically going to slam through the atmosphere and slow down. And when that happens, it creates what's called a plasma. There's a, like a fireball, an orange glow around the spacecraft. And it's just this beautiful, uh, orange, orange glow, and sometimes it, it pulses um, out the out the windows, and uh, I just love the experience of of coming back home. It's uh, yeah, unlike uh, um, anything that I've ever seen before. Knowing that you're you're actually inside a fireball and it's three thousand degrees of heat outside, pretty wild. I, I think you also oh. asked about what it's like to to readapt to Earth's gravity after the flight? Was that part of the question too? Um, so yes, it was. first, go ahead. Oh, I, said, I just said yes, it was. Oh, okay, great. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the adaptation to, uh, uh, to Earth's gravity again is, is relatively easy for a space shuttle astronaut. If we've been up there for a couple of weeks, you may feel heavy uh, for an hour or two, but as you, as you move around a little bit, you, you get your, your balance back and um, you feel more or less back to your baseline in, in one or two days. The long duration astronauts, uh, including my, my friend Scott Kelly, who you may have heard about, he spent 340 days up aboard the International Space Station setting up uh, an American record, almost a year in space. It, it, it's really, really hard on the body. Uh, it's not just the... Uh, the balance, but also kind of the the uh, the coordination, the the strength, the the flexibility that you you once had. It's tough to to kind of keep that uh, when you're up in space for a long period of time. So those astronauts they uh, they have to uh, go into kind of physical therapy for several weeks to to regain all their strength and flexibility. Wow, I bet you that must be a, be fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they, some of the astronauts, they actually do kind of water aerobics. So before they start, you know, even doing hikes or you know, walks or runs, they'll spend time in the water kind of getting used to partial gravity, you know, supporting their, their body weight. And uh, they try not to, to, you know, rush it back into the full daily activities too quickly or they might get injured. Uh, so... Now I'd just like to go through a few miscellaneous questions and a question that I ended up missing on this list. Is that okay? Sure, you bet. So starting for the question that I missed, so, so Nina H10 from Springfield, Massachusetts, would like to know what it's like to brush your teeth. Is it hard to do in microgravity? Great question, Nina. Um, it's actually very similar uh, up until the point where you're trying to get cleaned up. So, uh, you know, putting a uh, toothpaste onto the brush is just like you would do it at home. Um, you might take a, a swig of water just to, to kind of moisten your mouth. So we actually have a, these little silver containers that we can uh, fill with uh, either fresh water or at a mealtime, you might have uh, a juice or a coffee or, or tea, something like that, that you might 
put a little bit of water in your mouth, swish it around, brush your teeth. But the problem is, what do you do with this messy toothbrush now? And what do you do with that toothpaste in your mouth? So what I always did is I would kind of spit the uh, toothpaste out on a, a piece of tissue paper and clean off my toothbrush and I would use the toothbrush again. But if you're a long duration astronaut, uh, there aren't enough uh, you know, paper towels and, and supplies to kind of support someone doing that for you know, six months. So what they do is they actually end up swallowing uh, the toothpaste and uh, the astronauts that have done it, they they kind of consider it their, their after dinner mint. So so they would uh, have, a, have a meal, they'd brush their teeth, and then they'd have to swallow the toothpaste uh, to keep it all clean. So it's a good question. Okay. All right then. So for our next for our next question, so Matthew would like to know why space travel is important and what type of experiments are done in space that cannot be done on Earth. Oh, great, great question. You know, it's so important that we we ask difficult questions that we press uh, press humanity into. To challenging environments, uh, not only trying to understand our place in the universe, which is very important, and trying to understand the direction that things are going, but we also go into space to try and improve the quality of life here on Earth for all of us. So when we go into space, we do things that are, you know, very space-focused, astronomy, astrophysics, uh, developing technologies to allow us to, to live for long periods of time in space, to, to colonize the moon and Mars and go places beyond. That's part of space exploration. But there's also uh, things that turn back towards Earth, looking at uh, global environmental change. We take thousands and thousands of photographs and, and other sensor data, looking at how the Earth is changing based on humanity's impact on it. Um, we also look at uh, different types of uh, scientific and physical processes so that we can make things better here on Earth. Can we develop tools and methods of uh, plant growth in space that will benefit agriculture here on Earth, develop new tools and materials that will be novel that will help people here on Earth. Uh, for example, firefighters in our military, uh, you know, fire retardant materials and, and stronger materials that will keep people safe. Um, medical technologies that uh, not only allow us to do science up in space, but will help people when they're having surgery or when they're in intensive care unit. So all sorts of different uh, dual purpose science that we do up in space that benefit all of us here on earth. And so that's the re real reason we, we go up there. Um, and what happens when we do that, when we invent new technologies and make new discoveries up upstairs, we call it, uh, upstairs in space, uh, it creates new technologies, new industries, new jobs, um, and it makes life better for everyone. I do know that a few inventions ca came because of the space program, like thermal blankets for survival and more heat resistant, lightweight materials, like you said. Many, many, uh, wonderful technologies. You know, it, it, um, I'm a, a doctor by, by training. And so many of the, the sense kind of the, Miniaturized sensors that uh, we use in, in healthcare derive from the space program. And a lot of the, the computer technology, the, the rapid advances uh, that we've seen in, in computer technology have their heritage in the space program as well. Uh, so yeah, the, the, we have a lot uh, to owe to the, uh, the space program. Mm -hmm. Okay, for our next question. Dagan, age 21, from Happy, Kentucky, would like to know your thoughts about the rumors surrounding the possibility that the moon landing never really happened. <laughs> it's a fun question. Uh, well, uh, what, you, you, what you can do, Dagan, is you can actually go to the um, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter website. You can Google that, of course. Um, but you can actually see on the lunar surface uh, not only evidence of you know, where the um, the lunar rovers uh, visited the moon in the late 60s, early 70s. We can actually see the hardware that's still there. Uh, so there, there's very obvious uh, uh, proof that uh, you know, we have been there and, and we have done that. We also have 830 some odd pounds of lunar samples here on Earth that are quite extraordinary, that are benefiting us, understanding 
the evolution not only of our moon, but our Earth-Moon system and also our solar system. Um, I think it's really important uh, uh, to really focus on uh, the, the science uh, that uh, supports our, our knowledge base. Um, I, I, it's, it's interesting to see that you know, there, there are uh, uh, conspiracy theories about climate change and uh, many other things, but they're not based on, on scientific fact. I, I really strongly encourage everyone to, to really um, try to understand the, the scientific bases for things and, and, uh, and uh, you know, read up on, the, um, on, these, on these matters because it really is important um, now more than ever. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So for, for our next question, several of our viewers asked, how did you get to be an astronaut? Did you, are, did you have that as a dream you always wanted to do, or did it just happen? Yeah, you know, I, I wanted to be an astronaut ever since I could walk and talk. You know, I, my, my father worked on the Apollo program. That, that was the program that took the first astronauts to the moon uh, back in those early days. And so I had model rockets and posters on the wall and ambition to, uh, to fly in space. Actually, I wanted to be the, the first to set boot prints down on Mars. That was my my life stream. It didn't quite work out that way for me, but maybe it will for, for one of you guys. Um, but uh, um, it, it uh, was something that uh, I thought would be really exciting, uh, would challenge me, and uh, it would benefit humanity. And those very same things can be said about the space program today. So I'm really excited to, to meet you and your, your community of, of, uh, of kids who are excited about space and Hopefully, you'll, some of you will get a chance to go there yourself one day. Um, there's going to be so many different opportunities for, for people of your age to get a chance to do it. You know, there are exciting companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic who will take not only government astronauts like myself to space, but in, in the not-too-distant future, if you have a, a cool scientific experiment or an engineering project that you need to do in weightlessness, you'll be able to get a ride on a Virgin Galactic uh, spaceship ride and test it up there. Or maybe you'll be able to buy a vacation and spend uh, a week on an orbiting space station for, uh, for spring break. Um, or maybe even go to the moon one day with your family. So it, it may sound a little far-fetched or crazy, but I think it's gonna happen in the not too distant future. I say that too. It's gonna be a lot of fun when it does. You bet. So do you have any advice for future astronauts like Sam from Hazard, Kentucky? Absolutely, Sam, and, and anyone else who might be interested. Uh, the time is now to, to set your, your course to do that. Um, and what's really important is not only to have lofty dreams like that, but to, uh, to figure out a pathway between here and where you want to go to. And, uh, and maybe break it down into achievable steps along the way. And that's kind of what I did in my life. I knew I wanted to become an astronaut since I was a little kid. So I, I saw a number of things that I could do that would increase my odds of, of selection. I became a, an Eagle Scout. That was one of the programs that I went through. I was, um, and I was involved in lots of different team sports and team activities. Um, but uh, I also appreciated the fact that if I was going to be an astronaut, I really needed to be uh, literate in science and math and in medicine. And so I became a doctor. That was my, my pathway to the stars, if you will. But, uh, you know, I think if you wanted to uh, become an engineer or a scientist or a physician, um, you know, develop some skills that would help you be able to contribute uh, once we start colonizing the moon and, and moving on to Mars. You can kind of figure out what those special skills are. Work really, really hard at the things that you're doing. Don't just uh, uh, mail it in. You want to, if, if you're going to do it, be the very best that you can possibly be. Work really hard, and you'll find a lot of success down the down the road. Whether you become an astronaut or you become a, a, a climate scientist or a politician or whatever 
it is that you want to do. You know, try and be the very best that you can be and prepare yourself as thoroughly as you can. And uh, it'll take you a long way. I'm sure they'll do great when whatever they choose. It could be anything. That's right. So, so now I have a few questions from some people who didn't exactly want to be named. So I was suggested to ask, what are you doing now that you were retired from NASA? Well, I, I'm really excited about what I'm doing right now as well. So I'm, I'm the CEO, the chief executive uh, officer of my own company called Fluidity Technologies. And it's based on uh, drone play control, um, moving a drone with precision through space, uh, whether it's flying for fun or for cinematography or for uh, rescue purposes. But ultimately the, uh, the controls, in fact, I can show you one of these right now. Um, this is one of our controllers. This is called the FT Aviator and it's flown with a single hand and uh, allows us very intuitively to move through uh, physical space. So one day we'll be able to use a controller like this to actually steer a surgical instrument through the human body or to pilot uh, a flying car or an ROV under the ocean or to fly uh, in, a, in a computer game or a virtual reality environment. So uh, we're really excited about uh, our company and, and the things that we're able to do with our, our technology. So that's what keeps me super busy right now. And uh, yeah, but that's uh, primarily my, my day job. And then uh, I'm uh, uh, also an inventor. So uh, I have some other innovations that I'm, I'm bringing to market as well. So that's, that keeps me pretty darn busy. I'd say so. So, so I do have a few, I do have a few questions from someone else as well. Mm -hmm. So what experiences prior to your selection for the astronaut corps, do you feel best prepared for your space flight? Well, um, that's an interesting question. I, I think when I uh, was training as a physician, I was in a program, a residency program in emergency medicine. And I think the wonderful thing that that taught me is uh, the ability to, to manage uh, crises. So you can, I don't know if you've ever been in an emergency room before, but they can be really crazy places, especially uh, you know, in the evening time uh, when ambulances are rolling in and life flight is bringing in patients and uh, uh, it just can be a, you know, totally chaotic. And you have to be very calm, you have to focus on the, the critical patients uh, in the emergency department and assess the life threat and, and uh, triage things and, and take care of everyone. You have to juggle all these uh, competing priorities and, uh, and you have to do, do that in a, a very cohesive team environment. And so I think that was one of the best training grounds for me to be able to manage the, the challenges of you know, working up in space. That makes sense. So for our next question, uh, what are the preeminent psychological and physical challenges for a crew on long-term space missions, such as the ISS? Great question. Um, so for, I'll just contrast it for being a space shuttle astronaut, we would spend about two weeks up in space. Uh, it's pretty easy to get along with anyone in, uh, for that duration of time. But if you're spending six months or more, if you're going to Mars, for example, you might be with a small crew for two or more years. So crew compatibility and the psychological factors are really, really important. You're also a long way away from home, especially think about it. If, if you were out on Mars, it might actually take 21 minutes for me to say good morning to you. 21 minutes for me to say good morning in the microphone and for you to receive it. And then for me to get that message back, you might say, good morning back, how are you doing? Uh, then it's 42 minutes round trip for us to have just one exchange. So there's a, there's a real sense of distance uh, and separation that I think Martian astronauts are gonna have that we didn't have even aboard the International Space Station. We could pick up a radio or a phone and talk to our family pretty much any hour of the day astronauts now can tweet from space, they can uh, browse the web. It's a very different kind of experience. So I, I think the, the psychological challenges of these outpost missions on, 
on Mars are going to be really difficult psychologically. So a lot of effort has to be put into making sure that the people are really compatible before they uh, get sent off on that, that epic mission. But some of the other medical things that are really concerning to us, when you're outside of the Earth's magnetic field, when you're out beyond where the ISS is, say if you're on, on the moon, on the lunar outpost, you're actually exposed to a lot more radiation from the sun. It's, it's actually generating lots and lots of, uh, we call them coronal mass ejections or CMEs. So there's lots of radiation there. And then there's galactic uh, um, cosmic radiation as well that, uh, that travels all through the, the universe. And so your exposure to radiation and, and cancer risk is a lot higher. So we have to worry about shielding the habitats for the astronauts there so that they don't, you know, at a young age develop really serious cancers. So those are a couple of the big issues that are of concern. And then we're also worried about astronauts' eyesight on long duration missions. We're seeing that some of our astronauts are coming back with pretty significant changes in their visual acuity. And what's happening for some strange reason is that the, uh, the pressure inside the skull is actually increasing. There's, your brain is actually in a, in a fluid. It's called CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. And uh, that pressure for some reason builds up and changes the shape of the back of the eyeball. And we've got to figure this out because you know, it would be terrible if we sent astronauts out on a two or three year mission uh, to Mars and they came back blind or something like that. So um, that's, that's one of the other huge risks that we've got to understand a little bit better. Well, I didn't know that. No. It would be really bad if that happens during the Mars mission as well. You bet. you bet. So for our next question, recently NASA announced that they would open the U.S. portion of the space station for private astronaut missions, including space tourism. So what are some of the challenges to integrating these private missions in the ISS? Do you see a commercial future for the ISS? I do. You know, I think this is the, I call it the barnstorming era of commercial human spaceflight. And, and you're way too young to uh, remember or know what the barnstorming era of aviation was. But when they first had uh, airplanes, biplanes that, uh, you know, soon after the Wright Flyer uh, the very first airplane was invented. Uh, pilots uh, would fly around their, uh, their local areas and they're called barnstormers. They would come down into a local field. They would take people for joy rides. Uh, and, uh, and that was sort of the beginning of, of commercial aviation. Those airplanes were then used for, for the military uh, and also for uh, the mail service. So they had Air Post was a fairly early you know, role of, of aviation. But now, of course, you, know, you, can, you can get on the internet and with a few clicks of a mouse, you can buy a ticket and be anywhere on the, on the surface of the planet within maybe 24 hours. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing what happened in the last century with aviation. And I think what's gonna happen in this century is we're gonna have that same sort of accelerated uh, capability, but it's gonna happen in space. You'll be able to, you know, uh, go vacation in Earth orbit, maybe able to go to the moon one day, maybe we'll, you know, Elon Musk wants to colonize Mars. So these kinds of things are, are going to happen. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the first steps, of course, are going to be using the International Space Station uh, as a platform for that as well. There have been, uh, I think, seven different uh, uh, space tourists who've flown so far, uh, flying up and down on the Russian Soyuz capsule with the Russians. But now there are other commercial vehicles available, including very soon the SpaceX Dragon capsule and maybe Blue Origin and, and Boeing will have their own capsules, capsules that'll be able to take you know, paying customers up. Whether they're tourists or they're scientists or engineers working for a company, uh, I think it's gonna be pretty exciting. The, the challenge is gonna be uh, knowing uh, you know, what not to touch and, and, and being respectful and making sure that they don't uh, do any harm because you know space is a pretty unforgiving place if you if you turn the wrong valve. <laughs> yeah, that that could be bad. Well, I would like to thank NASA science, NASA engineer Dr. Tracy Prater Prater from in Huntsville, Alabama, for the last three questions. And now on to our last question. 
this question is from Rob in Asheville, North Carolina. And he wonders what is NASA's plan for water acquisition and purification when they establish a base on the moon? Uh, great, Rob. Uh, well, uh, there are two strategies. Um, and one is actually already in use aboard the International Space Station. And the astronaut joke is, um, yesterday's coffee becomes tomorrow's coffee. And what, what that means is that we recycle everything. It's the, the breath that you exhale, there's moisture there, and it's also the urine. You can actually uh, recycle urine and get all the impurities out and make it more pure than the water that comes out of your faucet. So we're gonna recycle you know, very extensively uh, the, the crew habitat uh, on the moon. We also have the ability to, to do what's called in situ resource utilization. And that's a ISRU, it's a, a NASA a buzz term, but it's basically mining the, the local environment for water. And so on the south pole of the moon, we know that there's actually quite a bit of trapped water ice. Mm -hmm. And so if we could go harvest that, if we could uh, gather together uh, that water ice, uh, we could melt it down, we could drink it, we could actually break it down, we could hydrolyze it and use the, uh, the oxygen to breathe. Uh, to grow plants, to, to do whatever we want with it. So uh, those are the big strategies that we'll be using both on the moon and also on Mars. There's a, a lot of water uh, on Mars as well for us. Okay, that sounds like a great plan. Yeah. Um, before, before I have to let you go, is there anything else you would like to share? I just wanted to thank you for having me on your, your program. And I have to say you're a great host. Uh, I've, it's been fun. Uh, receiving all the questions from your uh, your audience and uh, I wish all of you guys the best of luck. Uh, it's a, a really exciting time to be alive right now. I know it can it can seem a little overwhelming right now with what's happening with the coronavirus pandemic and being trapped at home and not having the, the freedoms that you normally would have but as best you can try and use this time uh, to uh, to your benefit. Uh, spend more time with your family, learn a new skill, um, teach yourself a new language, you know, whether it's a foreign language or computer coding. Um, you know, these are unusual times, but if you're motivated, you can actually use this time to your benefit. And uh, I, we are gonna get past this. And I also think that once we're past it, the, the future is incredibly bright. Not only, um, you know, uh, just in general, but I think specifically in space. There's going to be a lot more room in, in space for all of you. And uh, I hope you're excited about it, and I hope you take part in it. I hope I get to as well. Well, I want to say thank you all for tuning in to Science Time with Jody, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye, guys. I hope you enjoyed Dr. Scott Perizinski's down-to-earth answers to your out-of-this-world questions. And I would like to sp send a very special thank you to Dr. Scott Perizinski for giving me the privilege to interview him. I would also like to thank Tom Cravens, the director of the Challenger Learning Center of Kentucky, for introducing Dr. Perizinski and me, which made the whole interview possible. And thanks again to all of you who sent in so many wonderful questions, and to those who took the time to, to watch today's episode. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Science Time with Jody, and I hope you have a good day. Bye!